Over the last, God, has it really been five years? Christ, I'm old, I'm an old man now. Anyway, in the half decade I've spent toiling away at this mediocre little program, I've covered a wonderful spread of ports. Some good and some, uh, not so good, but there's usually something left to be said about each game that, for whatever reason, doesn't make it into an episode. So as the other two episodes I'm working on are taking a lot longer than I had anticipated, let's revisit five games I've covered previously to bring you five fun facts about great ports, as well as resolving a long-standing mystery surrounding the real Ghostbusters game on the Game Boy. So let's go, Thad, cue the titles. No, that's not, do the, do the, do the proper one. Do the port center one, it's, it's, it's in the port center folder, it's, it's, it's on the J drive. The, no, no, the J drive. It's on the J drive. I looked at this one way back in 2014 and had some very kind things to say about it. It takes the basic framework of the original Dead Rising, strips out the time-sensitive stuff, and replaces it with a more arcadey, time trial experience, which I personally, and somewhat controversially, found much more enjoyable than the Xbox 360 original. But though I called attention to similarities between this game and the Wii port of Resident Evil 4, I neglected entirely to mention that the reason those similarities exist is because Chop Till You Drop actually uses is the Resident Evil 4 game engine. This accounts for some identical in-game visuals, including the red ring that surrounds collectible items, the font used in parts of the interface, and even the aiming reticule. This makes sense. Why would Capcom go to the trouble of making a whole new game engine when they have another one that does everything they need it to do just sitting there, ready to go? Longtime viewers of the show may recall that Tomb Raider developers core design did something similar with the Mega CD port of Chuck Rock 2, which was built using the game engine originally built for Wonder Dog. And of course, Darkwing Duck on the NES runs in a heavily modified version of the Mega Man 5 engine. Chop Till You Drop has a bit of a reputation as an inferior port, which personally, I think is undeserved. It's well worth your time, particularly if you enjoyed the Wii or PlayStation Move versions of Resi 4, though it is, of course, considerably harder to find. I spoke about Lemmings in the very last episode I produced before moving to this channel back in 2015. It's not an episode I'm particularly happy with, which is why I'll be revisiting it in the near future, but one of the things I didn't cover in the original episode, mostly because I didn't know at the time, is that the two Sega ports of the game actually have exclusive levels not seen in other versions of the game. On the Genesis, or Mega Drive as it's called in more civilized societies, an entirely new difficulty setting was added to the game named for Sunsoft, the publisher of the game in the US and Japanese territory. This setting adds 30 levels not seen in the original version of the game, and while one of these is lifted from the Oh No More Lemmings expansion, the remaining 29 are entirely new and notoriously difficult. Over on the Master System port, which didn't get released in the US, a handful of levels that were too big for the system were replaced with new ones, many of which are, surprisingly, Sega-themed. The Sega logo features prominently, occasionally shuffled around for comedic effect, which makes sense when you discover that this port was actually published by Sega themselves. Pretty neat, eh? I discovered these levels earlier this year when I found a blog called The Lemmings Diary, chronicling the author's attempt to complete every official Lemmings level ever. Sadly, the blog stopped updating in April of last year, with the last post having gone up on my 31st birthday, which, you know, not the best birthday present. You should have bought him a tie. So their playthrough of Lemmings 2 sadly remains unfinished. That's a pity, because it's a fun read for any Lemmings enthusiast. Speaking of Sega, one of their all-time best games is undeniably Sonic 2, which took the formula of the first Sonic game and drastically improved it by making it, you know, good. It's since been re-released on about a qualimpupillion platforms and included in a number of collections, including the Sega Genesis Classics collection which recently dropped for the PS4 and Xbox One. But Sega has been cranking out compilations of its Genesis games for a long time. In fact, a number of their Genesis stables were ported to the PC in the 90s and early noughties in collections like this one, Sega Smash Pack 2, which of course included Sonic the Hedgehog 2. 
Sega Smash Pack 2 is just a pack of various Genesis games running in a very nice emulator, but probably the coolest feature is that the split screen mode in Sonic 2 doesn't squish the two screens like the original Genesis version does. Instead, the emulator ups the screen resolution to a whopping 640 by 480 and gives both players full scale, one to one pixel presentations of the game field. This was awesome when I first saw it in 2001 and I'm always disappointed when this feature doesn't pop up in newer compilations for more modern systems. It seems like such a no brainer. Sega have always been slightly ahead of the curve when it comes to porting their games to PCs. Even the GameCube quote unquote exclusive, Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg, got a European exclusive PC port. But uh, that's something for another episode. Yes, it's Worms, the turn-based strategy series I inexplicably keep coming back to regardless of the fact that I'm the only person who seems to still care about it in calendar year 2018. Worms Armageddon is widely considered to be one of the better games in the series, though the more recent Worms WMD comes alarmingly close to toppling it from its annalid throne. Worms Armageddon is the third entry in the series, but was only the second Worms game to see a multi-platform release, and most of these ports are really good too. However, anyone who opted to buy the PS1 or Dreamcast versions of the game would have been treated to something a little special, something not seen in the PC version. No, I'm not talking about those FMV sequences, those originally came from Worms 2 on the PC. Rather, there are two entirely unique level styles that do not appear in the original PC version. One of those themes, Domestic, has a very householdy sort of feel, while the other one features dinosaurs scattered across a very earthy terrain style. Nice. The graphics for these different terrain styles aren't present in the game data for the PC version, which means that either they were specifically added as a special treat for console users, or they were supposed to be in the PC version and sort of fell off. The console ports also retained the multicolored water seen in the PC exclusive Worms 2, but bafflingly omitted from the PC version of Armageddon. When Harold Ramis passed away, I chose to mark the occasion by talking about a video game loosely based on the Ghostbusters animated series, discovering in the process that it was released in different territories with vastly different licenses, originating in Japan as the fourth game in an ongoing series of Mickey Mouse titles. But an additional layer of mystery was found when I discovered that the game was itself based upon an old and largely forgotten Amiga title called P.P. Hammer and His Pneumatic Weapon but a cursory investigation revealed no link between the two studios. Nobody who worked on PP Hammer went on to work on Mickey Mouse, so what had happened? At the time, I described it as a huge f***ing mystery to solve. Maybe I'll get to solve it later in the year. But of course I didn't, and in fact I never returned to it, because actually following through with intent suggests permanence, and Port Center has always, to me at least, been an elaborate piece of performance art designed to teach you about the impermanence and changeable, temporary nature of the world in which we live. But the mystery was solved back in 2015 when the creator of PP Hammer, Gunnar Lydia, reached out to me on Twitter to tell me that Kemco's game was in fact a complete ripoff, and that although the publisher of PP Hammer, Demonware, had gone out of business shortly after the game was published, the rights to the game remained with him. This meant that the real Ghostbusters and its various international rebrands are unlicensed, unofficial knockoffs of an Amiga game. Lydia received no money from the sale of any of these versions of his game. What's more, because Demonware went out of business shortly after the game dropped for the Amiga, Lydia and his team never got paid for any version of the game. What a sad story. Still, he's supposedly still working on a mobile version of the game for iOS and Android phones, and I personally look forward to eventually getting to play it through again, and maybe even see him getting paid for his hard work too. You know, I joke about being the only person who really cares about worms uh, these days, but whenever I post an episode that has worms footage in, that's the game people ask me the most questions about. Very strange. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode very similar to this one, looking at five fun facts about bad ports. And then the next episode after that will hopefully be either the Animal Crossing episode or the Lemmings episode, depending on which one I get done first. But thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all of that fun YouTube stuff. And I'll be back in a couple of weeks with another one. Take it easy. Or don't. It's your life.